Well, the first thing is a question about the context that we're living in. My own view is that this is an extremely exciting time to be alive as a development professional. And one of the reasons is the SDGs, because the SDGs are universal. SDG number, am I using jargon that is SD, are you comfortable with SDG? Sustainable Development Goals replacing, um, we hope, depending on the decision of the um, <coughs> General Assembly of the UN in September, but very, very likely, I think, because of backing of the G77. And the already, <coughs> Sustainable Development Goals have already been integrated in national policy. I learned last week in, in New York. They've been integrated in Brazil, in Ethiopia, and in Indonesia three widely scattered. And we've got some Ethiopians here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you have already, you're ahead of the game. <laughs> because you've already incorporated the SDGs in national policy. And one of the SDGs is number 10, is to reduce inequalities between and within countries. That includes Britain. <laughs> <laughs> It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant and because they're universal. And let us hope that they get through. Um, but that's one of the reasons why I think it's very exciting. But it's also a very exciting time to be alive um, because of the methodological revolution, which is, which is there for anybody who wants it. And what I'm hoping to share with you this morning is a bit of this methodological revolution, but also the fact that the whole trend, the sort of magnetic trend in development is away from this revolution. So it's a question of, um, well, it's, it's more than a rearguard action. It's a question of a really, really strong offensive to try to make this real. That's my view. I've often been wrong in the past, and you will use your own judgment. <coughs> so in terms of context, there's both that excitement those two excitements. But there's also <coughs> a third factor, which is this, and we are not doing this as a participatory exercise with all of us, but this is what another group came up with. I asked them for poor people, for vulnerable people, for people who are marginalized, for people who are excluded, um, for people who are stigmatized. Are the things for them changing slower than they were 10 or 15 years ago, about the same rate or faster? And you can see the result. Can you see the result? Mm -hmm. It's dramatic. And this is a very, very widespread view of people in workshops like this. What it means, though, is that if things are changing for them faster and faster, we have even more of a challenge to keep in touch and up to date. And one of the ways of keeping in touch and up to date is by being participatory and having participatory relationships and using participatory methods. Because this enables those people, it can be empowering for them, but it also enables them to express their reality. So we have these questions here. Whose knowledge, whose priorities, whose appraisal, whose analysis, whose planning, whose theory of change, whose action, whose indicators, whose emanating, who participates in whose project? What is our normal mindset, our default mode? It's us, 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 all the time, not them, them, them. And the question is, and I, in my view, the opportunity is to continually and repeatedly turn this on its head so that it's their reality that really counts, and their rapidly changing reality, which we have difficulty keeping in touch with and up to date with. So there are all these questions, which I won't go through. The who and the what questions, but you can look at this, and if anybody wants to photograph it or do any copy it out or anything, you're extremely welcome. And add your, you can add your own. <coughs> But the answer to all these questions is actually that they can. And one of the fundamentals of participatory approaches and of participatory statistics is summed up in the slogan, they can do it. I mean, 
to say us and them is, I know this is a, an, an unfortunate binary, but you know what I'm talking about. They can do it again and again. Experience has been that people who are lowers can do more than the uppers suppose they can. Children, in my view, almost invariably can do more than their parents think they can, except in China. <laughs> The Chinese seem to have got a, a genius for, um, they, they, there's some secret there, which I think the rest of us need to, at least I speak for myself, need, need to learn. Because they seem to be able to bring children on very, very fast, at least if you judge by the pianists. <laughs> Maybe they're very exceptional. <coughs> so this is really exciting because if we can turn things on their head, then it is a different reality which may be expressed. And different categories, and different insights, and different priorities, not those that we project onto them and suppose that they ought to want, but those which they actually do want. Because here you see awareness, aspirations, priorities, changing even faster in the view of this workshop than the conditions which they experience.